I have a three-year-old daughter who is begging for gymnastics lessons and she's pretty good. She's got the body type. She's got, at least right now, the passion and the desire. And right now I won't put her in because I know if she is good and she advances up the ranks, the people that will be in charge of her safety are not people that I trust. My name is Rachel Den Hollander. This is why I spoke up. I think there needs to be a lot more focus on why this happened and how it can happen. And that really is the story here. That's really what needs to change. I can speak out about my personal story, but my personal story doesn't change anything unless it changes the societal dynamics. As long as the culture is conducive to abuse, there will be abusers. I was the first person to come forward and publicly speak against Larry Nasser and file a police report against him. I saw Larry when I was 15 years old in 2000 and he abused me sexually for about a year, um, almost until age 16. Um, but I didn't speak up until about 16 years later when I saw the first chance to stop him. The choice to speak out really was because um, I saw the first chance ever to be believed. When Indy Star released their report on the culture of abuse within USA Gymnastics, I knew immediately this is the time. And I made the choice at that point to speak, uh, to speak publicly, to use my face, to use my name, to tell my story on camera, uh, because I knew that was the only way to reach other victims. You know, a lot of abuse victims, the ones that choose to speak out, they catch a lot of flack for speaking to the press. I've been called a media whore. But what people need to realize is it is absolutely vital to have that because when you're dealing with a prominent public figure, the only thing that's going to make those organizations stop backing them is, the, is a public outcry. Coming forward anonymously would never be enough. Me battling Larry in the courtroom, I would not be able to overcome the presumption, probably even to get to the courtroom. One of the reporters emailed me back and said, someone else has come forward and they've said the same name. We can move forward now. And that was just amazing to me that someone else had, had seen the same thing and that had come forward. I cried. It was the first time there was um, validation and I knew I wasn't alone. For the first time, I wasn't alone. The impact of speaking up and doing so very publicly is, it's a really mixed bag, to be honest. It's worth it because I was able to tell the truth and I did everything in my power to stop him and at least my conscience would be clear. At the same time, it is very painful. You know, it's making a choice to, to relive those memories on a continual basis until this is done. It's been over a year and hardly a day goes by that I'm not in contact in one way or another with, uh, with an attorney, with something that's going on in the court case. Um, so it's always very fresh. It's a choice to relinquish all your privacy, every shred of dignity you ever had. There are a lot of dynamics to why there's so much shame around abuse. Um, you know, part of it, I think, is because of the societal blaming. All victims blame themselves. How could I have been so stupid? How could I have not seen? Why didn't I fight back harder? You know, those are the questions that play in a victim's head every night. They played in mine for years and years. When a victim speaks up, the most tragic thing is those are the same questions they're asked. No victim who has those voices screaming at her all the time needs people outside of her adding to that weight. And so that's part of the shame um, because people, people heap it on the victim, almost as if it was her fault. That's part of what society needs to understand better when they respond to victims is people don't do this for, for kicks and giggles. This isn't something you do because you want attention. This isn't something you do because you get something out of it. It's an incredible sacrifice to speak out. Gymnastics itself really lends um, towards a, a culture of abuse just in that um, there's, a, there's a huge emphasis placed on authority. Do what we say or you don't get on the team. Do what we say or you don't get invited to the camps. The cost to that person when you're motivating them through fear is very significant and very damaging. Once you control someone's emotions and you have uh, put them in a position where they are afraid to speak up, where they know they will lose everything if they speak up, you've created the perfect environment for every single type of abuse to flourish. USA Gymnastics is named in the lawsuits because they facilitated an environment where abuse was able to happen. And because their own policies were so abhorrent in how they handled sexual assault that it created the perfect environment, not just for Larry, 
but for hundreds of sexually abusive coaches to continue preying on little girls across the country. They had a policy where they would not report uh, abuse unless the, the report came from the victim or the victim's parents and was signed in, in writing. That never happens when you have child sexual abuse. You know, it takes victims of childhood sexual abuse years, often decades, to be able to come forward. So to require a policy that the victim has, has to sign a written statement detailing their abuse before they're going to potentially report it to authorities essentially ensures that they're never going to have to. It's over a year since these stories have come out, and the only response that they've had is, is occasionally tossing a little bone to the victim's way and saying, well, we're sorry you got hurt. That is not the same thing as saying you were sorry for what you did. But the board of directors, most of those members have been on for a very long time. And as much as they're waving around this report of all the changes that they're going to make, I can say this much. If you have to pay someone to come in and give you a 100-page report telling you to report the rape of a child, you have no business being on the board of directors. In a deposition in William McCabe's trial, a coach who was certified through USAG who was allowed um, to hop from gym to gym sexually abusing little girls, uh, it came out in his trial that USAG had a file that was a couple of inches thick on warnings about McCabe's behavior in all of these different gyms and that they had never reported him to law enforcement. Penny was, was the president and so as the president he has um, significant responsibility for what happens under his watch. And when Penny was questioned about that under oath in his deposition, his response was that they couldn't report these coaches to the police because they wanted to quote unquote avoid a witch hunt. You know, that was the way Penny characterized people warning about sexual abuse, witch hunters. Throughout this entire process, USAG has never recognized uh, the, the role that they played in creating this environment. You know, the Indy Star investigation found that the USAG had buried 54 coaches' files over a 10-year period. That's an astronomically high number. It really does start again with setting the overall tone. And that goes back to how you handle abuse complaints, the tone that you set in the organization for how victims are going to be treated, for how pedophiles are going to be treated. If I had seen a pattern of USAG saying, whoa, we've got a problem coach here and this is how we're going to deal with it, this is unacceptable and it's not going to be tolerated and we are going to make sure that the victims are protected, that would have sent a very different message to me than it sent watching their continual silence. The first aspect of being able to demonstrate leadership is to take responsibility for your actions. You know, I require that out of my two-year-old. I certainly require that out of an adult board of directors who's in charge of athlete and child safety. They have not taken responsibility for their actions. And USAG, as, as head of, uh, of a sport that draws some of the greatest attention during the Olympic Games, has the ability to show some of the greatest leadership and to pave the way for other organizations as to how they should be handling claims of sexual assault. And that demonstration of real leadership is what every abuse victim wants to see. That's what I desperately wanted to see them do, and they haven't done it. I spoke first because I saw the opportunity, and I knew that somebody had to be willing to take the risk and make the sacrifice and, and make a decision that was ultimately life-altering, one way or the other. Part of my motivation for doing it was so that no one else would have to. For 17 years, I couldn't protect the little girls coming in and out of Larry's door and I wanted to more desperately than anything. And I thought if I could be the one to speak publicly and to take that risk and to deal with the pain of having to do it this way, it would be a way I could at least protect them now.